Mrs. Barry! I cannot let you have long. I must prepare tambourine. There's a great deal of setting up. Three hours Mrs. Barry? Of kettle drums and a deal of taking down. My Lord Rochester. I'm come, as I said I would. Will you have me lift my skirt? Or do you have a mind to raise it by your own endeavours? I'm come to train you in your acting. <laughs> so you said when we first met, but your reputation being what it is, I thought you meant something different. I have, I hope, many reputations. I am come, I say, to train you in your stage acting. Never in my life have I heard you spoken of as an actor. That does not deter me from spreading my insights to others. I thought it would not. Then we shall begin. You are familiar with the plays of Mr. Etheridge? There are but two, my lord. Not for long, I fear. The comical revenge or love in a tub. Have you seen Mrs. Betterton playing Graciana? Yes, I am her understudy. Indeed. Act two, scene two. I shall play Beaufort. Graciana, why do you condemn your love? Your beauty without that, alas, would prove but my destruction. An unlucky star prognosticating ruin and despair. You mistake. Tis not my love I blame, but my discretion. Here the active flame should yet a longer time have been concealed. Too soon, too soon I fear it was revealed. Our weaker sex glories in surprise. We boast the sudden conquests of our eyes. But men esteem a foe that dares contend, one that with noble courage does defend a wounded heart. The victories they gain they prize by their own hazard and their pain. That was not Elizabeth Barry. It was Mrs. Betterton. An understudy must imitate, not create. Yesterday you created. Yesterday I was dismissed. But you played truthfully. It cost too much to play the truth. I do not think you've considered this speech at all. Well, how would you have me do it? Let us consider now. What does it mean, that speech that Mrs. Betterton mangles so? Graciana means that she has given away the secrets of her heart too freely. Something that a gentlewoman must not do to a gentleman. Why not? Well, because men will take love for granted and then not prize it. And is our author right? Do you believe that? I believe men are hurdles that must be negotiated. Is that all? Do you never feel passion for us? I've counterfeited passion in gentlemen's beds, if that is your meaning. Counterfeit will not serve you on the stage. Yesterday, I was jeered and taunted by 400 ruffians. I know that will not serve me. And so you will take their word against both of ours in traffic and falsehood from now on? I don't know. Then let us gain knowledge. To the speech again. You played it sweetly. Graciana is not innocent or she would not have such insight. If you had ever loved a man, you would say that speech with regret because you would fear the loss of him. I'm well, supposing I have loved. Then show me in the speech. Sir, you mistake. Tis not my love I blame, but my discretion. Here the active flame should yet a longer time have been concealed. Too soon, too soon, I fear, it was revealed. Our weaker sex glories in surprise. We boast the sudden conquests of our eyes. But men esteem a foe that dares contend, one that with noble courage does defend, a wounded heart. The victories they gain, they prize by their own hazard and their pain. Well, was there improvement? Did you think so? I wish to know your thoughts. Was better. But now you're too angry. Of course I'm fucking angry! You walk into this theatre in your 30 shilling boots telling me how I should set about my work? I warn you, I have a temper and I have been known to strike out with the first object at hand. Well, and if that be a property blade, well, some have sharper edges than is needful, so have a care. Ah. To die on stage at the hands of a beautiful woman. I am no such! I think I can make you an actress of truth, not a creature of artifice. I can do this. But I cannot train you unless you give a little towards me. It's not in my nature to give. I have my talent and I'm jealous of it. And though I give you credit that you and you alone in all the town have seen it, I am not so dazzled by the Lord and Master in you that I cannot resent you. 
You are right. I am intent on doing something that no other has yet done. And I lost my purpose yesterday with fear of the pit. But I will conquer them. And it shall not be said when I have my fame and my two pound a week that Lord Rochester took to me and touched me with the shining wing of his genius and so turned me into a little corner of his greatness. No! I shall be valued for me and for what I knew I could do upon this stage and for what I, Lizzie Berry, how I, I took the heat of my own soul and moulded it and turned it into a wondrous thing and so triumphed. If I can help you to that triumph, I am not so devoted to the trumpeting of my own works that I would wish to take credit. So you say now. But in the alehouse, when the play is done, and the talk is of my Cleopatra, will you not glide towards your cronies with a, I taught her that piece of business, or she could not be heard in the gallery till I instructed her in a trick or two? Madam, I offer my services. If you see no advantage in them, they can as easy be withdrawn. You could buy my slit for a pound a night, sir. I would not mind that. But I think you would not have it so. What I think you want is power over me, which I do bridle at, for it is only I who can do what you say I can do. If you wish to play a part in this, I would strongly know why. Ask yourself what you want from this theater. I want the passionate love of my audience. I want when I make a sweep of my arm to carry their hearts away. And for when I die, for them to sigh for never seeing me again. Till the next afternoon. There is your answer. I want to be one of that multitude. I wish to be moved. I cannot feel in life. I must have others do it for me here in the theater. You are spoken of as a man with a stomach for life. I am the cynic of our golden age. This bounteous dish, which our great Charles and our great God have more or less in equal measure placed before us, sets my teeth permanently on edge. Life has no purpose. It is everywhere undone by arbitrariness. I do this, and it matters not a jot if I do the opposite. But in the playhouse, every action, good or bad, has its consequence. Drop a handkerchief and it will return to smother you. The theater is my drug, and my illness is so far advanced that my physic must be of the highest quality. Well, my lord, upon those conditions, I endeavor to do what you want. What I want is that we meet again tomorrow to consider Ophelia. Ophelia? Mr. Betterton will revive Hamlet next month and you will play Ophelia. Ophelia then, if you wish. But let us not neglect the lesson in Mr. Etheridge's speech. And what is that? That women should ever view men with suspicion. I shall be happy to return and address our work with that instruction written on the inside of my scalp.